speaking up and active, people active in their communities, that I'm not talking about a fringe minority or a silent majority, but the silenced majority, silenced by the mainstream media. The media today represents a minority elite. These all have to be challenged, and many people are doing it. It's Michael Franti here. This is Amy Goodman with Rochester. Rochester Indian Media. We're back. It's been a while. We miss you people. I'm Dawn with uh, Rochester Indie Media, the Barefoot host. And today's show, we're going to be talking about the history of the healthcare reform movement with Professor Theodore Brown. Ted Brown is here with us today, and he is a professor of history and community and preventative medicine and medical humanities at the University of Rochester. That's, That's right. a lot. That's a That's lot a you lot. have going yes. for you Big here. Big mouthful there. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, thanks for coming and Pleasure. trying to help us make sense of this uh, topic. Recently, you were on a panel. Um, one of um, a panel of folks that came out for a big town hall meeting and there was hundreds that came out yeah. in Rochester. There's a lot of energy around single uh, payer health care right now and why right now is it, does it seem to be bigger and growing and where are we right now with it? What did you think about that event? Well, I thought that event was wonderful. I think the head count was somewhere between 450 and 500, just about filled every seat in Eisenhower Auditorium. And it was great to see that because I think there is a lot of interest. Every poll, CBS, CNN polls, New York Times polls indicate that something like 75 to 80 percent of the population are really keen on health care reform right now. And a very large proportion of those, 65 or so, are interested in a single payer option. I think we may have to stop to explain what that means. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. a buzzword. We can go back. But but we can go back and explain that. But it's because the the crisis is severe. Everyone feels it personally. They feel it in terms of the premiums they have to pay in their own health care insurance. They feel it because their employer cuts them from the health care they had been provided before. They feel it because their kids are now not covered any longer by the insurance they had when they were going to college. And they have to come up with the money. And without health care, we are facing a disastrous situation. Mm -hmm. The Institute of Medicine calculated that something like 22,000 people a year die because they don't have access to health care mm -hmm. via insurance as the principal mechanism. And there are a lot of other problems. There are 50 million people without insurance in this country. Million. And of course, pr President Obama has made this a very high priority. Mm -hmm. He knows that health care reform is so difficult in this country that the only real way he's likely to get it through, even with his great popularity as a president, is to get it through early because the forces lined up against it are going to build momentum and if he doesn't carry on with the goodwill of the early years of administration mm -hmm. it might not happen so he's putting a lot of pressure to get something through now in this first year mm -hmm. the real question is we're all cheering for health care reform but we're also many of us worried that if it's reform in the wrong direction it may after the immediate short run in the longer run make things worse so we have to be very cautious about what option for reform. Well, we let's do that then and go back and talk about uh, the term single payer health care. Right. Is this just a recent term that's come up in the last 20 years or where is no, the, the term's been around place? probably for about 20 years. It doesn't <laughs> convey a lot even to the people who support it. I think a better way to explain it is to think of it as Medicare for all. Mm -hmm. Medicare is a program that we have in this country for those over 65 reach retirement age and a few other people, some other categorical groups to whom it applies. People qualify for it by paying in via a sort of a payroll deduction. Mm -hmm. It's an addendum and was in fact enacted as an addendum to the social security system. It's a social insurance program. Everybody in the country pays in. Everybody who reaches the qualification age of 65 can then take benefits out. Everyone shares in it. It's a very communal thing. So that's why they give it to people 65 and older, because they've paid into it. So anyone younger doesn't earn their. Well, it, it started that way. It's care. a complicated sort of pathway to it politically, but it began that way because it's a tack on to Social Security. 
and people generally at 62 or 65 qualify for Social Security retirement income. And in fact, the actual legislation is an amendment to the original Social Security Act of 1935. It was passed mm -hmm. in 30 years later. Some mm -hmm. in 1935 wanted health care immediately across the age spectrum, but there were various political battles that were fought that prevented it, and that's part of the long story here. Mm -hmm. In any case, single payer means, like a Social Security program, everyone pays in, there's one pot, and there's one payor. That payor is generally a government or a special agency of government, mm -hmm. which then pays the bills to hospitals, to doctors, medications, under the pharmacy benefit, Part D of Medicare. Single payer means there's a single financial mechanism but it does not change the actual structure of the healthcare system. People mm -hmm. have labeled it, labeled it socialized medicine, confused it. It is not a system in which any physician is on salary, any hospital is controlled by the government. It is simply a system by which the government collects money, as in Social Security, mm -hmm. and then disperses it to people who qualify and have earned that benefit by their payment over the course of their lives. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, there seems to be um, the majority of people, like the public, seems to be supporting this, like 60%. I mean, are the polls out on that? And a very little bit, but some, generally that range, 60 to 70% support it. So where are the holdups on getting this? Well, there are very strong opposing forces. One of the opposing forces, of course, the private insurance industry. Mm -hmm. Because the more of our insurance mm -hmm. goes in this direction, the less a piece of the pie they have. And for them, whatever their rhetoric, whatever their rationale, the bottom line is profits. Mm -hmm. They're private insurance companies, they have stockholders, they're in there to make profits, and they do that by collecting more money than they disperse in benefits. And the difference between what they collect and what they disperse, they pay you know, for marketing, they pay for executive salaries, they pay for various things, but it doesn't distribute care around the country. Yeah, I was reading something like the administrative costs alone, just like with the insurance companies, are like 50%. Well, the administrative costs of insurance generally averaged over various companies, and there are different sort of uh, specificities in certain industries or certain groups, but overall it's 31%. 31%. Compared to the Canadian rate, which is about 15%. Mm -hmm. compared to the Medicare administrative cost rate, which is somewhere between 3 and 5%. So if you just imagine a thought experiment, if we could ramp down the administrative costs that go for all these multiple payers, all these confusion, fancy executive salaries, fancy offices, marketing campaigns, all that stuff that's not part of healthcare, but part of the profitable part of the industry, if we were able to ramp down from 31% to, let's say, 15%, mm -hmm. we would save... 350 billion to 400 billion dollars, which would be enough to cover all the uninsured people in this country without requiring wow. a single extra penny of tax revenue. Right, and that's now, what people, that's where the biggest opposition comes from, right? Where people, like when people are against it, they're afraid of taxes going up or not having like the choices. You know, we're gonna talk about it when we come back. We have to take a quick break here and uh, We'll, we'll hear more about that. We're talking with Professor Ted Brown from the University of Rochester in the Department of History and Community and Preventative Medicine. You're watching Rochester Indie Media's Indie TV. Check us out online, www.indymedia.org. And um, we'll be back. Well, I'm here today because this rally yeah, is yeah, for well, Medicare for everyone. I'm, it's a, a long time since I've been 65. But I've had Medicare, and that has helped me get through a lot of crisis in my life. And it's time for every person in the United States to have the same kind of coverage uh, that I have practice for Medicare. Medicare. And are you um, happy with Medicare? Well, I, ha I happen to have an additional uh, support policy, you know, because when my husband retired, his company uh, took care of making sure that he had insurance. But uh, the point is that everyone needs to know that they can be covered. That they that that is a benefit. Something healthcare is like like ever, a, a natural uh, uh, necessity. I mean, you know that people should feel it's, that it's like having a fireman ready. You know, when you need one, you <laughs> yeah, want one. You don't right. have to pay for a fireman to come. Remember right. that. What yeah. about? Right. Um, have you been in yeah. since? Single-payer health care has been a long-standing oh, right. fight. Yes. Have you been in the fight before? Well, this or is, is this the, kind of the first time you're really no, been fighting? No, no. We've, we've been in the fight 
for a long time. And it uh, doesn't matter, I mean, the issues, whether they're civil rights, gay rights, human rights, anti-war, we've been in those struggles. And we continue today. It's not a good day for me, but I'm here because I believe Everybody, that everyone like to, should have the um, right, it's a right, to health care. Everyone's entitled uh, get started yeah. pretty soon. to health care. We're back. You're watching Rochester Indie Media's Indie TV. You can catch us on Channel 15 in the city at 6.30 Monday and Thursday evenings. And today we're talking with Professor Ted Brown from the University of Rochester, the Department of History and Community and Preventative Medicine and Medical Humanities. And we were talking about the cost mm -hmm. of um, health care in this country and the excessive amount that goes just for administration, administrative right. costs. And if we could bring that down, that would almost cover um, everybody and allow everyone to be insured and yet there is a strong opposition still to this although most of the people want it I know I want it I have no health insurance I'd love to right. you know be able to go and get a general checkup here and there not have to worry about losing my house or everything if there was a ca catastrophic event in my life um, so I think it's to the benefit of many people who've had those situations happen these huge losses but uh, the forces that are preventing it um, are larger than that, and it's almost mysterious, like who they are. Well, the forces actually have been operating for a very long time. One of the amazing things to many people is that this campaign for health reform in the United States goes back at least a century. You can trace it to the first decade of the 20th century. A very dramatic event was the launching of the Progressive Party in 1912, and Teddy Roosevelt, who had already been a president of the country, serving as standard bearer of the Progressive Party. One of the major planks in that platform was to create a national health care system in the United States as a social benefit for the greater good of the commonwealth of the country at large. And the forces that mobilized against that are the same forces that have mobilized again and again and again every time the campaign builds up some momentum. They are primarily those on the extreme right who have an ideological disposition to resent and to distrust anything the government does. Instead of seeing the government as an agency for the common good, for the common wealth, as Teddy Roosevelt saw it, they see the government as intrusive into the private marketplace, which is great for those people who have the resources and terrible for the people that don't. <coughs> the level over the playing field is the government, the government as an agency for good. And that's what the people in favor of uh, national health insurance, single payer, whatever version of it was offered earlier on, could see, but those on the ideological right, on the extreme conservative side of the political spectrum, didn't want to see happen. And they were joined by two other very powerful forces very early on. The private insurance industry, which was present already in the 19-teens, though was on a much smaller scale than it has become, mm -hmm. so it's become an even more mm -hmm. lethal political mm -hmm. weapon. And the power of organized medicine, which by and large, for most of the 20th and into the 21st century, to this day, has opposed moving in this direction. That's the been profit? Is it they're just afraid their profits? They're are afraid that, well, it's, there's a great irony. They're afraid their autonomy, their professional autonomy, will be interfered with by some government bureaucrat. They fought against it, and what they've got is a much more intrusive kind of interference on the form of bureaucrats from private insurance companies, mm. which are telling them to give less care for more profit for the insurer. And now, 59% of physicians polled say they're in favor of single payer. They would mm -hmm. prefer it to the mm -hmm. horrific system of HMO control mm -hmm. that they're under right now. Mm -hmm. The AMA, which claims to be the voice of American medicine, a very powerful voice at that, has declined in membership. People have left it in droves. At best, it claims 25% of the medical profession at the moment. Mm -hmm. Well, so this whole fear of it becoming centralized government control and um, socialize. It just seems like a contradiction for how large the government's grown well over the, like the two Bush administrations. Like when I think of it with like Homeland Security and just uh, how pervasive like the security culture as, as well as like um, just the the war culture and where that's spreading and th that takes massive government. So uh, it seems like a huge contradiction to. There are many contradictions in this and those on the right who oppose it don't like to look at those contradictions. Generally those people for example favor the VA system, the Veterans Administration healthcare system, think it's great, want to make sure it has Which adequate resources. Which has been resources. cut tremendously over well, the... It's 
The government, the VA system, is a truly socialized system like England. That is, there are salaried physicians, there are government-run hospitals, and those who are advocating for single pay or are simply advocating a Medicare or Social Security-like financing mechanism, leaving every other dimension of the healthcare system intact. It's the furthest thing from socialized medicine. What is your um, perspective with the Obama administration now, and if we compare it as the trends over history to like maybe what were some other high points where we've come this close to reformulating it and looking at it? Was that during the Clinton administration, and how is he differing or similar to what we've tried in the you past? Know, again, there's a long history. President Truman was very strongly in favor, but he was sort of chewed up by this buzzsaw of opposition and very frustrated. The real success, the achievement of Medicare, which is single mm -hmm. payer for those over 65, was during the 60s. Mm -hmm. And it happened because Kennedy started. Kennedy was struck down by assassination. There was a convergence of forces of the civil rights movement and of labor as a strong force wanting this, mm -hmm. with then President Johnson taking up the baton from President Kennedy. It, that converged to create just the right climate to pass Medicare for those over 65 in 1965. And that's getting, even that's pretty threatened right now, right? There's been a lot of cuts in the Well, there are always going to be decade. budgetary problems, but I don't think that any president, even Reagan, has had any success in trying to fundamentally cut back Medicare. When he did, there was a tremendous rebellion, and he had to back off. Medicare mm -hmm. is pretty safe, and if we can get this program for those across the age spectrum, which is the only logical extension, it seems to me, then that program would also be safe. President Clinton tried, but President Clinton was an outsider. He got elected because he's an outsider to the Washington gridlock. And he then created a strategy saying, essentially, I can't deal with Congress. They're going to be part of the problem, not part of the solution. And he brought in experts who had a very opaque process. It was mysterious and became overly cumbersome. Obama, to his credit, is much more effective, I think, in terms of political strategy. He is inviting Congress to play a part. That means he has congressional allies that Clinton never did. Mm -hmm. He is also trying to simplify it. Instead of creating a vast bureaucracy as Clinton did, he is trying to use good old American verities and good old American metaphors. Mm -hmm. He's pushing not for single payer, but for a public option. And the difference between single payer and public option requires some conversation. But basically, He's avoiding single payer, he does want a public option, and I think it may be an opening wedge to get the single payer, but he's very, very clever. And he's saying, you want competition, you mm -hmm. want the market, let's have private insurers, let's have public insurers, let them compete and let mm -hmm. the public decide. We think the mm -hmm. public's gonna decide in significant numbers for the pu public option. So that would enable, you could pay privately if you want, but you always have the yes. safety net and the backdrop of and uh, no program. one supporting single payer has denied the possibility of having supplemental programs in the private market. What we need to do is to just reconfigure the system so that we have a robust, good, strong, high quality single payer system for everyone who needs it. And that's what we'll talk about when we come back, reconfiguring the system and what that would look like for you and for uh, what is being presented right now via the Obama administration and people who have been really working on this. Stay tuned, rochesterindymedia.org. Uh, I'm a local physician. I work right here at Genesee Hospital, and I'm in primary care, and I have innumerable stories uh, similar about patients who didn't have access to care, and unfortunately, some of them turned out much worse. Uh, we just had a patient in our office three months ago, 52-year-old small businessman, entrepreneurial type, just starting his own business, couldn't get health insurance because he took out a loan for his business came into our office with shortness of breath and chest pains and was told by the doctor that he needed to go to the hospital. And the man said, well, I just took out a loan for my business. If I go to the hospital, I'm going to go bankrupt. You, you have to treat me at home. The doctor said, I can't treat you at home. The man says, you have to treat me at home. Eighteen hours later, the man was dead uh, because he didn't go to the hospital. And I, I have multiple other stories similar to that of patients who I know who have died because they didn't have access to care. And, and all of you have heard this and all of you know this very well. So I think from my perspective, I discuss this with my patients a lot. And the, the arguments that you've heard against single payer are common. And there's another very funny story that I think illustrates the misconceptions that we can potentially help to dispel. 
uh, a patient saw signs in our office talking about single payer and was arguing with one of the doctors about, oh, why do you want the government to be running your health care? I, I can't believe you're doing this, doc, blah, 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 blah. And, and he stormed out of the office and said, thank God I go to the VA. <laughs> and this is true, true story, just happened a week ago. Your health care, and, and, and we're going to jump right into it. So um, Obama avoiding this topic? You think of Obama as avoiding it? It seems like there's been a lot of attention of his administration on it. Am I wrong about that? And also like the media's take on what's happening. Obama's talking about a public option that's very important, but he is not talking about single payer. In fact, he has said explicitly that the public option doesn't mean single payer mm. for him. And the reason for that, I think, is strategic. He may want single payer. He has said previously that he thinks it's a very good system. But he's making a political calculation that as soon as he utters single payer, all the opposition forces will line up and they'll start shouting crazily, socialism, 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 and there'll be more heat than light and the political process will grind to a standstill. It's a tactic that's been used for a century. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it's a tactic that works. Mm -hmm. And he is a good enough student of history and a smart enough tactician to know not to use that label in order to achieve his objective, which is to create competition between a robust public plan and a, the private options we have now, which will be some progress, not as much as I would like to see, but definitely moving in the right direction. And how could the media be um, aiding and informing the public right now and helping uh, you know, with this understanding so people aren't just getting these fear tactics of socialism, 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 right. and that just automatically One thing the media everything. could do is to report on single payer accurately. There's been a, almost a blackout, and it's required a lot of pressure to get people first on the Bill Moyer show and then eventually wider exposure it's been an uphill battle by various advocacy groups to even get heard. When this happened in the Senate, when Senator Baucus was having hearings, he wouldn't even hear single payer discussed for a moment until people engaged in very civil, civil disobedience in order to get people's attention. And then the media began to pick it up. I think the media has a responsibility to really explain to the public what all the options are and to go to the core of what these programs really propose rather than to just satisfy themselves with labels, which are foolish and deliberately designed labels to misguide people, to obfuscate the issues, mm -hmm. and to have them turn against it before they even know what it's about. Which is a broader show than what we're talking about now, but the, the irony of that, I mean, we're talking about um, all this fear and opposition to socialism, as if capitalism has really aided us that much over the, you know, couple centuries we've, we've been trying to implement it, you know, um, within this country. People don't have health care, the education system's terrible, um, the, um, you know, the wars that continue to, Not like, to mention our robust economy. That yeah, and the robust economy <laughs> and, and the way, like, workers are treated. I mean, there's a million um, issues right now with uh, the flaws of capitalism. Do you think that um, it's just under a capitalistic system there, there is kind of this tension between just providing universally for people? Well, I think that that's a larger discussion, which we probably don't have time for. The more important issue is the notion of the market, whether people compete on the market for goods and services as if everything is a microeconomic commodity. Health care has been labeled that way and has been manipulated into that corner. Many other countries which have very good capitalist economies, I can think of Germany, I can think of Japan, I can think of Sweden, which have, uni have universal health care systems because they see no contradiction or incompatibility between having a capitalist economy appropriately regulated with so social services that provide what the a population needs. One of the most striking examples would be in Japan. In Japan, workers in Japanese automobile, in the Japanese automobile industry have their health care covered. That means Japanese automakers don't have to pay another fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars mm -hmm. to cover their workers for health care, which happens in the American system, mm -hmm. which explains why Japanese cars have been so successful in the global economy. That's not an issue. Doesn't mean that the Japanese automobile industry isn't capitalist, but the workers are covered because that's a social good. And I'd like to just mm -hmm. look back on the notion mm -hmm. that the government is the guarantor of the social good, of social justice, a notion that has evaporated since Reagan in this overemphasis on the market as the only guiding force. The market got us into this economic disaster we've been in, and we're coming out of it with a greater regulatory oversight. But why discount the government? Why, as Reagan said, say the government is the problem, not the solution? Many other people thought the government was the solution. I would think the government would be the solution in this area. President Kennedy, in a famous address supporting Medicare in Madison Square Garden, May 20th, 1962, said, the Medicare proposal serves the public interest. It involves the government because it involves the public welfare. The business of the government is the business of the people. 
And a few months later, well, in 1965, July 30, 1965, when President Johnson signed the bill after it had gone through Congress, he said, no longer will this nation refuse the hand of justice to those who have given a lifetime of service and wisdom and labor to the progress of this progressive country. It is the right thing to do. Government is the agency to do it. And the notion that only the market can solve things is misguided, which all our experience over the last several years, and especially this last year, should tell us all. The market, the market, the market. Okay, let's talk about what people can do. We like to talk about uh, direct action tactics. There's been some cool things. We're gonna um, show some clips between our breaks here about the Baucus aid. If you could just quickly tell us about the doctors and nurses going into congressional hearings and disrupting yes. things with information. How, how has that been effective? Well, they weren't disrupting things, actually. They were just asking, raising their hand to speak. And when they raised their hand to speak, they were arrested. So the next day when they went back, they had on their backs, we stand for single payer, and turned their back on Senator Baucus so that the camera could pick it up. This then got to be some news. A number of newspapers picked it up. Bill Moyers had it on the show. And the ball has begun to roll. Mm -hmm. There have been a lot of community actions, this community action in Rochester, demonstrations, rallies, anything of that sort that calls the public's attention to these issues, that gets the media's attention, provides the opportunity for a conversation that doesn't happen otherwise. Otherwise, it's a trading of slogans and slurs mm -hmm. rather than a serious conversation about real options and what these things mean. Mm -hmm. Well, what, what can we expect? I mean, how close is this right now to even being something we can see accomplished within Obama's like first term here in office? Do you think it's something? Well, really I'm, like about? everyone else, watching and waiting with a great anxiety about what will happen over the next several months. My guess is, if I can make a prediction, is that he may squeak through a public option as an alternative to just the private market continued as is. Mm -hmm. If that happens, then there's the opportunity over the next several years to expand it and improve it, to move it closer to single payer. I think that's what he's intending. I hope that's what he's intending. I'm not sure he will succeed in that. And if he doesn't succeed, those of us who support it just have to be back out there trying to educate and trying to demonstrate as need be. Well, that's great. Thank you for all this information and um, putting this in context for us. You've been watching uh, Rochester Indie Media's Indie TV. And we've been talking with Ted Brown, Professor Ted Brown from the University of Rochester. Uh, check us out. Check us out online, rochester.indymedia.org. And um, we air on Mondays and Thursdays at 6.30. And check us out there. Come to our meetings Thursday nights at 7 at the Anti-War Storefront. Get involved. Stay active. Take care. Thank you.